Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome. We're so glad to have you with us here this evening on Ask Herbal Health Expert Susan Weed, a two-hour radio show each Tuesday night. Herbal medicine is people's medicine, simple, safe, effective. Please bring your curiosity and health questions. Susan will enlighten, surprise, and delight you. I know most of you know Susan Weed already. She's my mom, so I know her. But for those of you who have not yet met Susan, I'd like to share, she is the author of the Wise Woman Herbal series, wonderful books on women's health and herbal medicine, including Wise Woman Herbal for the Childbearing Year, Breast Cancer Breast Health! Exclamation Point, The Wise Woman Way, Healing Wise, The Wise Woman Herbal, New Menopausal Years, The Wise Woman Way, down there, sexual and reproductive health, the wise woman way. And abundantly well, seven medicines, the wise woman way. The newest book in the wise woman herbal series. So exciting. In addition to being the editor at Ash Tree Publishing and writing her books, Susan is the director of the Wise Woman Center in Woodstock, New York. The Wise Woman Center is open to the public on appointment-only basis. She offers weekend workshops, intensives, and apprenticeships throughout the season. Susan is also available to you online via wisewomanmentor.com. There you can go and view her weekly e-zine. You can subscribe to receive a notification via email each week, or you could join her mentorship program. Susan also offers distance learning correspondence courses and online courses at the wisewomanschool.com. Join us there for colorful, instructive, easy video courses, including Easy Herbal Medicine with Susan Weed, Happy Knees, a cancer diagnosis, adaptogens for long life, and abundantly well companion course, wisewomanschool.com. You can also just go to her website, susanweed.com, where you will find thousands of pages online with recipes, articles, art features, and so much more. Well, for now, let's see what Susan has to share with us this evening. Thank you, and welcome, Susan. Thank you, Justine, and welcome, Sarah Ellen. Oh, thank you, Susan. How are you doing this evening? I am doing well. How is Huxbury? He is doing really well. He's he's a very sweet boy, Um, and so far, so good. Um, Things are still, like, on, um, but everything has flattened out. Um, it's been like pretty clean looking from the outside, and um, he's acting happy and eating and you know being part of the herd. So, hooray! Thank you for asking. Yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, yeah, asking. yeah. We had some amaranth greens for dinner tonight. Oh, yum! It's the season, huh? There's lots. Here's the season for amaranth, and my American Gardener magazine featured amaranth. And the woman who wrote the article about it said, it's rare that you find a plant that gives you so much beauty. Flowers that last literally forever. Edible seeds that are high-quality protein and greens. 
that can be easily cooked because you don't have to take the leafy part for, away from the stalk. The stalk is just as edible as the greens. Mm. And so oh, the one thing that, that the article didn't mention was <clears throat> it's a weed. Mm-hmm. What? Yes. Yes. <laughs> And usually abundant when I've seen it. <laughs> the amaranth that we were eating tonight was amaranth that an apprentice and I picked about a month ago, maybe even five weeks ago, and cooked and froze it because you want to get it before it starts to flower. The flowers are encased in this kind of hard, prickly outer thing, and they appear in every leaf axle. And so once it starts mm. to flower, it's not like you can just like break off the flowering top. Yes, it flowers on the top, but not just the top, but all the way down the stalk too. So once it, once it, and it's not even that the flowers are open yet. It's just like the flower buds, and already like poof, you can't really eat the cooked greens. So I get it early in the year, and we got quite a bit, and we cooked it and froze it. So we, I just took a bag out of the freezer, and we had it for dinner. How easy is that? Nice, nice. I and we talked about how on the day that we harvested it and prepared it, that it seemed like we were putting in a lot of work. But what if we figure that, wow, that work is going to feed us amaranth basically, you know, all year, that it's really not that much work at all. Yes, and like the nice that you get to just pull those from the freezer and have them for a nourishing, healthy dinner. Oh, my goodness, because time is – it's like – you know, I'm scrambling to make dinner these days. It's happening later and later. So to pull that stuff out of the freezer, I'm looking forward to making greens again and stocking up. Yeah, yeah. getting to be that time of the year. To mm-hmm. it. We were reading in my book of Australian weeds about amaranth, and it said that amaranth is sacred to Artemis. Oh, that's what we said. We said, well, oh, really? And the Queen Christina of Sweden, I think it was Sweden, um, created a order of Freemasons, women-only Freemasons, called the Order of the Amaranth. Mm-hmm. What? I didn't even know there were women Freemasons. This is all new to me. <laughs> I know. That's just like a whole ball of what's in it. <laughs> Yeah, that is. Like, let's stop there and be, huh, what? (laughs) Uh, Wow. (laughs) Wow. And I was musing about how much I enjoy learning and teaching spiralically rather than sitting down at a classroom with the lists of things that you have to memorize. That we had amaranth seeds on our rice last night, and tonight we have amaranth greens, and tomorrow we'll look at the amaranth plant, and um, this evening we're talking about it and reading what I call fun facts about it. And these, to me, these things um, enliven the plant into our lives. Oh, I love that. I love that. The plants love that. <sighs> <clears throat> And certainly it's not just a weed that you tear out. I picked a little bouquet of amaranth for this green goddess week um, to display. And, you know, just to you know, be clear, I actually pulled these out from my herb bed because they were in the way. And they can grow up to be fairly big plants. How big have you seen an amaranth plant get? Well, I get a big smile on my face when I think of amaranth because the biggest ones I've seen were there at the co-op that you belong to on the other side of the Hudson Valley, and I helped you harvest them when I was there for the Green Goddess Weekend. So yeah, those are the I've ever the seen. Green Goddess Week, which we're doing right now, and those were how big? They were big. I mean, the pieces that we took home were probably like three feet, maybe like right. two, two, yeah. Yeah, not yeah, really yeah, big <laughs> plants. Like my time is not going to yeah. survive that. Right. Mm-hmm. My time and my rue and my sage, my my it's my herb garden. I said, hi, amaranth, you're going to get too big. Come come and be a beautiful bouquet, and we'll all look at you and talk about you. 
Mm-hmm. And we can see why it's called red root amaranth, because it has a red root. In fact, that red spreads way up the stalk. <coughs> That's what and it's I the remember. color that amaranth likes. Amaranth will grow with red leaves, in fact. It's kind of hard for a plant to not have green leaves, because green means it's chlorophyll and it's making food, right? Mm-hmm. And when a plant can actually grow and tolerate having red or purple leaves, it's got to be really strong in order to pull that off. Wow, I love that. And then knowing the Artemis connection, oh, it's so right? beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and for me, one of the great things about amaranth is that it's one of the two known greens that are a complete protein. Amaranth and its sister lamb's quarter. Mm-hmm. And both are so generous. And both are I, so I generous. Know. Now, how many species of amaranth did that book say there were worldwide? Fifty thousand. It was some huge number, right? It's a lot of species. Well, maybe just five thousand, but it was like a lot. And, and that, and in the article that I was reading, they were they were talking about a lot of different kinds of amaranth too. And that some of them have really beautiful variegated leaves, that they've been cultivated for the variegated leaves. The regular Amaranthus retroflexus, the red root pigweed, will sometimes grow with um, a variegation of some red in the leaf because it likes it likes red. It likes to be red. And then I have, I think, maybe half a dozen red leaf plants growing, and they all have different leaf shades. Some of them have a little green veining in them. Some of them are like light red and dark red. Just gorgeous plants. All this beauty. Plus the leaves are edible and a complete protein. Plus you get the seeds. Mm. Mm. So the plants that we weren't able to harvest because they were too big and already going to seed, that's okay. We just let them flower and go to seed and then I'll harvest the seed. Yeah. The book we were reading said that um, King Montezuma, the Aztec uh, emperor in Mexico, received each year as tribute 200,000 bushels of amaranth seed. Oh, my. I was trying to visualize that. (laughs) I feel like I've gotten a really, really good amaranth harvest if I get a half a cup a year. But I'm not working with with varieties that are bred for seeds, right? Down there, the Aztecs were growing amaranth species that we may not even have because, of course, the Spanish, upon seeing the people so happy with their amaranth and honoring it, decided that this obviously was pagan idolatry and did their best to eradicate amaranth. What? Yeah. I don't know if you remember oh, back in, I wow. think it was the 50s or 60s, suddenly it was amaranth, the miracle grain, right, rescued from extinction. We had thought that there, was, there wasn't the, the grain amaranth, the ones that have a lot of seeds weren't around anymore, but the descendants of the Aztecs had gone up, up, up into the mountains because it's an annual that generally has to be grown every year and you get fresh seed every year. Oh, oh my and goodness. And then thus amaranth came back into the consciousness and has gained good ground now um, in things that are bread-like but wheat-free. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, amaranth bread has been found throughout Mesoamerica, buried with people and so on. So it was a big staple. I tend to throw it into things, you know, throw a handful of amaranth seed into some rice I'm cooking or into some uh, bread I'm baking or something like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. So easy. I love it. So keep an eye on that amaranth. And I am letting some amaranth grow in my garden, but I, I'm also, you know, a gardener. And so the, I garden my weeds, which means that there's 20 little baby amaranth plants growing. I'm not going to get a lot of amaranth seed, right? Right. 
Mm-hmm. They're all just going to grow up to be six inches tall and have seed and topple over and die. So I'm going to take out 90% of them. Mm-hmm. Not just for the sake of my time and my sage and my other plants, but because I'd rather have one big one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So what have you been up to? Oh, um. Well, it's been it's been feeling like a lovely week here. Um, I had ordered some St. Jones Wort um, fresh from Pacific Botanicals because I oh don't... wow, what a splendid thing to do! I would like you to talk about that for the next two minutes because I need to go get the information on tonight's guest. Can you do that? Oh, sure, no problem. Good. Yeah, so, so yes, Pacific Botanicals, that, um, early in the spring, they make available their list of fresh harvest plants that will come up when it is their time to flower. So I put in for my request, and I truly not sure how much uh, one pound of fresh St. Jones wort would be, uh, but I went with that. And so the fresh St. Jones wort arrived. It was just next day air, so uh, it was very fresh still. And I decided to make uh, three different uh, medicines, remedies, uh, preparations. So the first one I made was a tincture. And I just um, chopped up the flowering tops, which is what was sent, and put it in a quart jar, made it nice and full, a little fairy bed with a couple finger press to test, like Susan recommends, and uh, put my 100-proof vodka over it put a label on the jar and it was so amazing to watch because it started turning red almost instantly. So I had been a little worried as to whether or not 24 hours would be fresh enough, but um, the tincture gave me good um, indication that I think this is going to be a nice remedy. Uh, So after that, I decided to try something new and I decided to try to make an oxymel because I've been reading about St. Jones in preparation for the conference next year. And um, I'm really curious about the antiviral properties and I wanted to have a remedy that was available in something other than a tincture because for me, taste is something really important when I'm working with an herb and um, especially when I'm using an herb to help me feel better and get more well. So I tried it in Oxymel. I boiled my apple cider vinegar, um, just standard Heinz um, apple cider vinegar that I buy in glass jars and boiled that up to make sure it was pasteurized and added in some honey, got that um, warm only and let it kind of cool to where it was not too hot when I poured it over the full jar of the fresh St. Jones. So I made another quart jar of that. And then um, the third remedy I was able to make with that one pound of fresh St. Jones was another quart. And um, I decided to do just an oil. So a little nervous about that. Um, But hopefully the 24 hours of being, um, in the airmail will allow that to be just the right amount of moisture and freshness to make a nice oil without getting moldy. It's starting to turn red already. And, uh, yeah, so I'm very excited to work with those remedies. Hooray for Pacific Botanicals. Yes, because I've been looking everywhere for you, St. Joan, and I have not seen you yet. My eyes are just dancing around the other yellow flowers and, I don't know. We haven't connected locally. So, yeah, thank goodness, Pacific Botanicals. Thank goodness for Pacific Botanicals. Our guest tonight is Kim Kitchen, a multidisciplinary artist who works primarily with audio and film as a result of a debilitating and transformative illness. She draws on her lifelong connection to the primordial mother, and her ancestral homelands of old Europe to engage a practice of critical inquiry into body-mind relations. So stay with us until 9 o'clock or come back to East Coast time, and you'll be able to hear Kim Kitchen talk about the amazing things that she is doing. Mm -hmm. 
do we have anybody with questions tonight? Uh, yes, we have three hands that are raised, and I'll remind everyone else listening that if you have a question or would like to speak with Susan this evening, you just need to press one, and then your hand will be raised. We'll see you in the queue and open your line when it is your turn. Tonight, the first dialed in from the 845 area code. From the 845, you are live with Susan. Hello, Grandmother Susan. How are you? Pretty good. We're considering whether or not we're going to have to abandon our spot as the mosquitoes hone in on us. How are you? Oh, oh dear. Um, I, I have, I have no mosquitoes. I did not do any watering uh, this year, and or gardening really to speak of. Excuse me, one second. Thank you. Uh, and, of course, I'm very sad about that, but the lack of mosquitoes, I I am, I am, couldn't take it this year. Um, you know, I'm bedridden, so if they get in my house, I can't even sleep. So, oh, that is just the most awful thing. Um, what do you think the best remedy is for that to keep them away? I, I've heard yarrow is the best. To get rid of fleas? Uh, I thought you said uh, mosquitoes. Oh, mosquitoes. Oh, I thought you said fleas. I thought you were asking me about your fleas, not about my mosquitoes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I was, okay. No, I was you, you know, my land my has a hundred springs. To turn, turn off so there's a, um, so much water, and even in a fairly yeah. dry year, there's a lot of water here. As a matter of fact, when I moved here in the 70s, the neighborhoods used to get together and hire a plane to spray chemicals in the summer to kill all the mosquitoes. Yeah, I remember that. I remember the truck going down the street with the spray right. coming out, and the kids right. used no, to they run from after it. Plane because you can't get to most of the ponds and springs from the road. But, you know, I was one of the wave of newer people coming in here saying, no, 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 excuse me. I actually want to use this water to, for watering my garden. I do not want it laden with things to kill right. mosquitoes. Thank you very much. Well, I guess with, you know, the rocks and everything must keep all the moisture more on the highlands more than, you know, the lowlands, right? That's where they would go, I guess. I'm just up the road from you, and uh, but um, gee, uh, it's not like where you live. I'm not on a goat hill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we we always have a lot of mosquitoes because there's large ponds as well as all the springs. So, do you worry about uh, any? Do you have any concerns about um, any diseases or anything with that? Or is it with just the mosquitoes? Nuisance? No. Now, what yeah. I'm currently right. um, focusing my worry about, uh, and I haven't finished the article yet, so I can't really even tell you about it, is okay. a really stunning article in Scientific American saying that the next plague will be a fungal plague. <gasps> oh, I think it's already here. Well... Not in terms of killing off millions of people, it's not. Well, yeah, I guess not. It's here in my body, though. Um, I'm living in a very moldy environment. You can hear my voice. It's yeah, I can. Suffer- I'm suffering greatly from what I believe to be a fungal infection that has been probably going on now for like six years. And I've I've been lucky to be very healthy and eligible to 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 gather the necessary um, proponents in nature and make my tinctures. But now that I am non-ambulatory, I can't afford to just buy everything. And I thought, oh. Let me just, you know, give it a whirl and see if my body can handle it, you know, on its own. And it's not. It's not handling it. And I'm getting very worried, very worried about this fungal 
infections. I used to use a ton of reishi. I would drink probably a gallon of it a year for like mm, several years and then maybe a half a gallon and then a quart and then, you know, I was down to, you know, a pint and then now I have nothing this year. I wonder if I've heard reishi, it's a, it's a, it's a fungi, but that it will destroy any other fungi it comes in contact with. Have you any knowledge on that or do you, no, I, anything. I haven't. That, As I said, I really just am starting yeah. to open the door. I want to see what this article has to say, okay. and I do want to start exploring the okay. antifungal herbs that right. I know of are horsetail, equisetum, arven. Yes, yes. And plants containing berberine. We talked about this last week, but not in terms of fungal, but Wow. I have the hugest bush growing, and I could crutch out there and and get my. You, you like we said, you want to go and get the bar under the bark, right? And and use that. Exactly, the barberry okay. bush. You want to go down to the thicker part of it, where it actually right. has bark, or you can go, even go and dig up roots of it. It's considered right. what invasive, and, and there are places where people would be very happy for you to cart roots of it away and um, use the I, yellowest part of it. I keep hearing that. I've been here 25 years. I have one plant. It's, it's never spread anywhere else on my property. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But I Birds have, spread on, it. What? Birds spread it. It it doesn't like spread itself, oh. Oh. but birds eat the berries and then the seeds are in their droppings. Well, the good news is to the world that I usually eat the berries before the birds, <laughs> <laughs> and then they're in your droppings. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Maybe it'll kill my monkey pox if I ever get there you with go. that. <laughs> so I look forward to your research, and the reason I called tonight. Is like every other uh, reason, and I am just blown away. I was going to specifically, I was actually crying, bawling my eyes out. Why can't I break my mind and body connection? Whatever happens to my body, my mind won't let it go. And I'm not thinking about it, but when you talked about the food poisoning and your body thinks, You know, it's still there. That happened to me, and I'm still dealing with it. And I look forward to that show. So I guess we'll just wait for her to see what she has to say. But what I really want want to know now is, can you tell us how exactly you preserve your greens cooking and freezing. I mean, I know how to cook and I know how to freeze, but how do you do it? I've never done it before. Nick Nick and I harvested amaranth by cutting the main stalk and bringing big bundles of it Mm -hmm. home. We made sure that it didn't have any flower buds. It wasn't prickly at all. When we got home, we rinsed dirt off of it because we were at a farm and there's dirt there, right? It's not, the area is not totally covered by plants. So there was actual physical soil on it, which wears down your teeth, is gritty. So we rinsed it all and then cut it up. If there were places where we had cut so far down the stalk that the stalk was like seriously woody, we cut that part off. But in general, right. the stalk, even when it feels stiff, is still edible, and we cut that up into pieces maybe an inch to an inch and a half and put them wet into a large pot with about an inch and a half to two inches of water. Mm -hmm. Usually I start my greens with only an inch of water, but amaranth is kind of a dry green. Oh. Like if you cook kale, there's there's water that's going to come out of the kale. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amaranth is not going to do that. Oh, 
That's there's not water well, it's in a the amaranth, yeah. so that when you cook it, it actually absorbs some water. Like so I green. started out with a little bit more. Also, if I'm going to freeze it, I like to f- put some of the cooking water in the freezer bag with the green, because then when I reheat it, I have some liquid to help reheat it. That's what I was wondering, because what I was under the impression of was that after you cook the greens, you don't want any added moisture, but with amaranth, you you might. Yeah, you do. Okay. It's not with amaranth. It's with a green I'm going to freeze. Any green, you would use the cooking water? Any green that I'm going to freeze, I'm going to put a little water in the bag with the green to freeze. Oh. Not just water. I'm going to put some of the cooking water in that bag. The cooking water, yeah. Then when I take the frozen green out and reheat it, there's that little extra bit of water that is going to evaporate as I heat it, right? So let's say... In fact, when I serve it, there isn't any water. There isn't right. any liquid. It's gone. It's right. gone. So it let's goes say through heating it up. So I you cook, I cook yeah, the amaranth ahead. until it's very soft. That's usually at least an hour. Yes. And then I let it cool, except for what mm-hmm. I eat right then. Right. Because we always eat some immediately. I let of it cool course. and yeah. pack it for the freezer with some liquid. And I usually put it in pack. Put the amount in a package that I consider to be four servings. What kind of package? Like that's that was I my use other question. plastic Ziploc bags. That, that's what I would and use. And for yeah, amaranth, okay. half a bag is four servings. I served half a bag of amaranth tonight, and it was more than four servings. Four of us ate as much as we wanted, and it looked like looked to me like there were about two servings left still in the pan. Is that a, a gallon bag? No, 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 a quart bag. Oh, a quart bag. Yeah, amaranth is a complete protein. It's very rich. You can't just I chow need, down on it. I need like, to... Well, it fills you up. It's power food, yeah. I need to have this in my life. Um, I can't have any of the commercial grains anymore. I, I love your Well, it does make about, a grain... Is that what Lamont. you said? You can't have commercial grains or greens? Uh, grains, like wheat or isn't amaranth, amaranth also considered a grain? No, it's not. Grains are the seeds of grasses, and amaranth is not a grass. Oh, really? Oh, it's I a feel pseudo-grain. Stupid. People mistakenly call it a grain. Yeah, I've heard that. But it's not a grain because a grain is a seed of a grass. Rice, yeah, 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 yeah. wheat, right. rye, oats, corn, millet. I like your post on the uh, Lamas um, and all the grains you listed. I can have all those grains, the ancient grains I can have. Yeah, I just can't right. have the modern ones like the corn, not the corn, the um, the wheat. And um, well, so you're wheat, good with I, kef, but not with wheat. Good with what? Kef. I never kef had is an kef. older kind of wheat. I never. Uh, had, you, oh yeah, no kef. I, do you I, do I, icorn wheat? It's also an older wheat, I and there are more of those either. older wheats on the market now, which is nice. I never heard of that. Um, from what I know, I'm just having corn and uh, rice. I hear you. Um, anyway, you've really changed my uh, health with your knowledge, uh, speaking about how to cook, and I'm I'm doing it much better now, and I'm feeling much better. It's going slow. The mind-body connection, I think, is my problem. What I... I was sitting here all day meditating on all the hurts on my body, and I said, you haven't let go of a single one of them, have you? And I don't know why I think I have, but the next time a new hurt comes, and the one I have right now is the big one, 
where I can't even walk yet, but I'm going to walk again. I'm getting very, very close. I'm remineralizing that bone. I'm, I changed my gut diet. Uh, how do you say it? Di, diabosis? Di, uh, the, the, the flora? Dysbiosis. Dysbiosis. Say it one more time. Dysbiosis. Yeah, dysbiosis. I've improved that. So now I'm uh, actually absorbing the nutrients that I'm putting in my body. And it, it is just unbelievable how simple you make it sound when you speak of how to cook food. But it, it, it was an incredible mind bender to change all my bad habits and get good ones. And when I first heard you say cook your greens for an hour or three, I thought, what is she talking about? You know, <laughs> I don't want to eat mush. And now I'm cooking low and slow, and I can digest anything now, except for raw nuts and seeds. I still have to grind them up into a paste. But that's okay as long as I can get them, right? Yeah. You know, nature protects seeds in several ways. First of all, most seeds have a hard seed coat. And that that prevents us from getting to their nutrients. And also, should we be able to break into that hard seed coat, the seeds contain what are called anti-nutritional factors. They go by a lot of fancy names like lectins and so on. But yeah. basically what anti-nutritional factors do is they turn off your ability to absorb certain key nutrients. Oh. Present in every raw seed, oh. which means that raw nuts are very much interfering with good health. So how do you uh, like I to... roast them. I turn and on I... my iron skillet. Yeah. I get it hot. I put my nuts into my hot cast iron skillet, and I stand there with a wooden spoon and stir them while they roast. How long? When they're just about roasted, I turn the fire off because that cast iron skillet's going to hold the heat for a while. At that point, I can walk away, but I do need to come back every five minutes or so and stir them again. Give a little stir, yeah. How long do you do that for? And then I might put a little umiboshi on it or a little tamari. How long do you do that for? You want to roast the nuts until there's a color change and a texture change. Okay, but I guess it depends on temperature. So I'm thinking like mm, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, less. You're not going to be standing there stirring for that long now, are you? No. (laughs) (laughs) No. (laughs) Well, I I, I was... As a child, my job was to stir the pudding, and that was a long stir, let me tell you. (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. No, nuts are faster. And I don't do a whole bunch at once, right? It's not like I'm roasting a pound of nuts at once. You know, I'm roasting enough for a week or so. So if you put the raw nuts or seeds in anything and cook in another dish, it's still cooked, right? It's It's cooked, right. It's actually cooked in another dish. But most people, when given the choice between a roasted nut and a raw nut, if they're letting their pleasure be their guide, they'll choose the roasted nut every time. And some nuts, like cashews, are actually quite poisonous raw. That one bothers me, and that's not really a nut, is it? It's a nut, but it's... I thought it was a legume. Cashew tree. In Costa Rica, they say that the cashew tree was created by a prankster. A what? A prankster? A prankster, like a coyote kind of figure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that so if you lean mean? against the cashew tree, it will stain your clothing black, and you can't ever get the stain out. Oh, it's like the Mississippi mud. <laughs> right? And the uh, cashew um, fruit, there's like stuff around it that's like poison ivy. Ooh. And then the nut kind of hangs down from, but the fruit is actually edible and it's good. Cashew fruit is delicious, right? And then the nut kind of hangs down from it. 
So it's a really altogether strange thing, which is why they say a trickster made it, right? Is there a name for that uh, coating? Uh, I heard seeds and eating the coating, and then the seed grows. uh, So they're doing a favor. uh, That that the cashew has to be eaten by something. Yeah. Yeah. That's true, right? Yeah, that's what we just said. Seeds are generally eaten by something and deposited in some fertilizer. It's some distance away from the parent plant so that a new generation can get off to a good start. Does that happen with people, too, if they eat a raw seed? Uh, I don't know. If I guess if you leave um, it in the woods, it could. But most of it flush, most of us flush it away, and so it can't. Well, yeah, no, I mean, assuming you were going to deposit in the natural world, <laughs> which, of course, number two is not generally... Well, the last you know, time you ate corn on the cob, did you turn around and look at your bowel movement the next day? I look at it every day. <laughs> well, what do you see after you eat corn on the cob? A healthy bowel movement. You see corn? Yeah. You see corn. Same with mushrooms. All pieces of corn. Those are seeds. There's corn seeds. Right. Right? And if you had eaten that corn raw, it would be possible for them to grow and sprout. If you deposited them with your bowel movement in a place where they would be happy. Yes. That's so interesting. You can see. They go right through you, right? Have you ever yeah. eaten um, raw sesame seed and seen raw sesame seed in your bowel movement? Yes. There you go. That would sprout and grow. That's why. Uh, wild, I guess huh? that's, that, that is pretty wild. Uh, you wonder, like, is the seed doing anything in your body besides procreating when it gets to the other end? Um, I th- think that it um, acts as kind of a, um, a bit of fiber, but in terms of, like, g- being able to absorb, absorb any nutrients from it, no. Yeah, I guess we're pro- our acid probably just gets rid of the coating so that it's ripe for germination. Exactly. Yeah. So your your mind-body guest is fascinating. I, I read that it was going to be art. And I had no idea, but my question about the mind-body thing uh, was just realized to me that I have a problem. I don't know who has any wisdom. I've I've heard many stories and doctors, you know, saying all kinds of crazy things. But uh, so I never really took it. Seriously, I, I I just thought, oh, it's just an excuse, you know, that they're using to try to say, um, you know, it's not in your body, it's in your head. And I thought, no, it's in my body. And they're like, no, it's in your head because it's done in your body. It's not there anymore. You just think it is. And this is going to be a fascinating Well, if you think it is, then it's within your power to think it isn't. Well, I I expected you to say such a thing. I just don't know how to make that stick. I keep uncovering all these old wounds lately, and I'm, like, floored that they are still in my mind. I, I thought they were, I was done. Well, one of the techniques that I use for doing that is to get a book and write those old wounds down. Oh, yeah? And thereafter, if they come up in your mind, you say, I'm sorry, you're already in the book. I actually you're not allowed called... to think it anymore once it's in the book. You can read the book all you want, but you're not allowed yeah. to think those things anymore. I actually called down to Florida to search out somebody who assaulted me in a very horrible way when I was 15. And I got a 97-year-old man on the phone, and we talked for 13 minutes, and he said, 
just live your life to the best you can. You got to leave that stuff behind. There's no time for it. And I thought, wow, what are the chances of hearing that from a stranger? And I told him my story. I told him why I was calling, who I was looking for, and what I wanted to say. And he said, nope, that's not what you want to do. You want to live your life to the fullest. Be happy. And I'm I'm like, yeah, I'm trying. I don't know why I keep getting haunted by these things every now and again. I guess it's because I'm so isolated. I've spent almost a year in solitary confinement. And it's been quite a challenge. And you have been my best friend. I look forward to these weekly uh, blog talks. And um, I'm just so amazed, Susan, that I would call, I would press one every single week, but that would be rude. So <laughs> I just wait. And almost always you bring up the subject that's on my mind or another caller does. And I say, well, look at there. There's the answer. So I love you so much, Susan. You are one of the most magical, majestic creatures I have ever met. Thank and you I thank so you. much. That brings a big smile to my heart. Thank you. I appreciate you, and I appreciate all that you bring to this show. Green blessings and good night. Good night, Susan. All right, and it looks like we have four callers that have pressed one with their hand raised, and the next caller is dialed in from the 570 area code. From the 570, you are live with Susan. Hello, come in, 570. Well, it looks like blog talk has actually frozen up here, so... Oh, yeah, it's circling. Uh, get that refreshed. Hopefully, that will do it here. Oh, oh boy. Okay, let's see. Hang on, everyone. Uh, okay, I think, I think it's back from the 570. There we go. It looks like we're okay. Okay, hey. Hi, Susan. Hi, what's up tonight? Okay, so I'm so happy to talk to you tonight. I've been following you for probably 10 years, and, you know, you've really changed my life with your infusions and my tinctures, and I so appreciate you. Um, I haven't called in very often because I haven't had really any health questions. I'm I'm 59 and super healthy, and, um, however, something has presented itself in my life that I I have a question about, which is called ghost pipe. Um, A friend of mine called me the other day and said, you know, have you ever tinctured ghost pipe before? And I said, no, I I really don't even know what it is. And um, so I I researched it and, and I went to her property and tinctured it um, on site Um, and then, you know, I'm a physical therapy assistant. And so, um, I had this patient that works for an apiary and the person that he works for has like a tincture of ghost pipe. So I thought, well, let me call him and see, you know, um, what his experiences are with it because, um, I, I understand that it's like a Native American, um, you know, remedy, um, and it's rare. I don't know a lot about it, so I wanted to see what he thought. Um, and he told me that he had a tincture that was like six years old, and he hadn't used it because he wasn't really sure about you know, his constituents and how they would affect him. So I thought, well, this might be a good, a good reason to call you. 
and see what, you know, I've never heard anybody talk about ghost pipes since I've been listening to you. So do you have any input on that? Well, I do, but you may not like it. That's okay. All right. So here's a plant that you know is rare, and what did you do? Take very little of it and tinctured it. It's the root that's effective. The root, the root itself is. You have to. It's a perennial plant. And you have to dig up the root and kill the plant if you want to make a tincture. Okay. Okay. What color did your tincture turn? You took a little of the top part, which means the that tincture... it can't flower and reproduce. No, like I, I did. I the root, the tincture turned black purple. Yes, it should turn black purple. Yes. So you must have taken, I mean, there's not much of it in the first place. So when you say you took took a little, I'm unclear as to what you actually tinctured. Tinctured a small amount of the cluster, a very small amount of the cluster of pine. Okay, but you did take, I, I, take root in all of the cluster. Yes, a small right. amount of it. Right. Yes. And so what I'm saying is it's a rare plant. And you made the tincture on spec. Mhm. Mhm. I could condone you doing that if you had a reason to make this tincture. I need this remedy. There is no other remedy that will do what this will do for me, and therefore I'm going to take a small amount of a rare plant. I understand what you're saying. But you don't even know what you're going to use it for. That's true. Um, and this woman. And so I am appalled me. that you would that's do okay. that. That you um, would just immediately okay. dig it up and tincture it without even knowing what you're going to use it for. It will be back next year and next year and next year and next year. Mm-hmm. 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 Unless it's disturbed. And sometimes rare plants like that, if they're disturbed at all, die. I hear you. I had a I very rare plant on my property. I showed it to someone, and because I let someone else looked at it, look at it, it died. Mm-hmm. We didn't okay. even touch it. And it was okay. gone the next year. Mm-hmm. I begged it to come back, and I swore that I wouldn't look at it, and I would never show it to anybody else. It did come back, but it took some years before it was willing to come back. Okay. Plants are rare because they don't want to be used. Okay. So the best thing you can do is to make sure that your tincture bottle is completely airtight. Put wax around it. Don't put it in a rubber dropper bottle. You know what I mean? A dropper bottle with a rubber top? Yep. Because it will evaporate right out through the rubber. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And then just, you know, hope that sometime in the next hundred years you figure out what to do with it. Okay, I appreciate your information. Because it's not, Thank you. it's not a remedy that anyone really uses for anything that I know of. What did you find out about people using it? I mean, convulsions, um, pain, emotional pain. Um, that's emotional why I'm pain. We have Hawthorne. I mean, that's why I'm talking. This is to what you. I'm saying. This That's is why I'm not telling you. It's a because plant I'm not that, sure. we, that has a special characteristic that we don't find in any other plant. I, I only that. use rare plants when I can't, they have something that I can't get anywhere else. I hear you. And it and showed I up have, in my, my life. My native in Vermont rarely used it. They had a lot of kind of like okay. about the fact that it was white. Okay, I hear you. And what so, did they use it for? I'm sorry? What What did they use it for? They didn't, is what I'm saying. Because it was white, they didn't think it was good to use. Okay. Is what the grandmothers told me when I said, this plant, and they said, you don't use that plant, that's white, that means you don't use it. Okay. Most cultures, white is the color of death because bones are white. It it is known for corpse plant, right? So I understand that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if there's like 
a bunch of nettle or a bunch of goldenrod, plants that are really common and you want to make something and you don't know like what it's for, what it's going to turn out, I don't have any problem with that. But this is a plant that is not only somewhat rare, there's less and less and less of it because it requires a lot of even moisture. I was just curious because it, it showed up in my life and then somebody else had it. And so I was questionable, you know, maybe somebody needs it in my life. That's all. That's why I was calling, you know. I don't think um, anyone needs it. And I want to ask you, please, the next time you're with a plant to wait before you take it, before you disturb it. If you could do that, I would appreciate it. I hear you, and I will. Thank you. Thanks okay. for your call. Green blessings. Green blessings. All right, and we have four callers that have pressed one to raise their hand. The next caller has dialed in from the 646 area code. From the 646, you are live with Susan. Hello. Hello in the 646. All right, let's try from the 512. From the 512 area code, you are live with Susan. Hello. Hi, hi. Hi, how are you tonight? Well, I guess you already answered that question. Sorry. (laughs) Well, these came up and there's fewer mosquitoes now, so we're still here. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, I, uh, okay, let's see. So I called probably about three and a half years ago with kind of a similar issue, but, um, I was pregnant and the midwife that I was with did a thyroid test, uh, blood test while I was pregnant and it came back, um, with elevated TSH, and I think, I don't really remember what the T4 was, um, but basically, after I, I was seeing a doctor as well for sonograms throughout the pregnancy, so. um, Idea was it to expose your baby to sonograms throughout the pregnancy. You know, it's not allowed in Europe. Uh, well, I didn't know that, but I... Oh, it's there. It interferes massively with brain development. Yeah, I have read that, actually, in my second uh, pregnancy. I no reason, unless you're very high risk for some reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... Um, See, with the test, well, I haven't had one. what I suggest oh, what? for most people is just say no to tests. Oh, yeah. I just, Is there some reason to suspect that your thyroid needs help? Well, there wasn't. Uh, okay, so I, 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 so I was talking to the midwife. She was actually kind of a friend before she became my midwife, and we went. She worked at a an, a, an herb school that I took some classes at, and. Um, I was talking about thyroid function because I was saying, you know, oh, I wonder how my thyroid uh, is because, like, I noticed that I started holding on to weight. But it was sort of like I wasn't actually seeking to test it or anything at that moment. I was just kind of making conversation, and I didn't really think about, you know, I, I don't know, but when... Then when we did the blood panels, which didn't really seem optional, I know you said that actually. When I talked to you the last time, you said um, that your sister, who is a midwife or was a midwife, I guess, um, that she wrote that book about Her partner blood and fry. Oh, that's right. Yes. Okay. 
Anne Fry, right. And when I but mentioned he that, checks the she blood work in pregnancy. And when I called her and said I'm pregnant, what blood work should I have? She said, Oh, for goodness sakes, absolutely none. Stay away from those things. I know, but I don't know if I can find a midwife that would agree to that. That's the hard thing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so and the scans. I mean, they were. Actually is this your first? Is this your first pregnancy? No, no, it's not. It's May 4th. And so, so you don't know what a healthy pregnancy is like? Yeah, I do. I mean, I I think I do. God, the more I have them, the more I don't, you know, yeah, I think I know what it's like. I feel like I'm perfectly fine, but, yeah. You are perfectly um, fine, but you're making yourself vulnerable to being over-treated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm so, a bit of a pickle. Probably, you know, in your situation, probably the best thing to do if you don't want all these tests is to mm, hire a midwife when you're eight and a half months pregnant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, definitely if I were by myself, I would do that. And we did actually wait pretty far with the my uh, well two pregnancies ago I waited pretty far into it but um, yeah so well I guess you know somebody um, else wants your pregnancy managed oh well my husband you know is really worried he wants you to be managed he's he's uncomfortable with your sovereignty yeah, probably. I mean, to some degree, I guess. I mean, well, I, I, really, I, I, you know, um, <laughs> and you're going to let him get away with it? <laughs> well, I don't. I don't. I don't know exactly what to do. I guess. Well, what would you happen know? if you say no? I don't want my pregnancy managed. What would happen? What was the worst thing that could happen? Um. Well, I guess I worry that he would try to take a position like I'm, you know, neglecting the health and well-being of the baby or something like that. Because he's done this in the past? Um, Not exactly, but that's just, I mean, yeah, he kind of has like a personality where I think he would think that. You know, like thinking and, and doing are different. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that he would actually act on that judgment, but I think that he would be really uncomfortable, and then um, it would just so you yeah, would it would be a sacrifice day. your well-being, your health, and comfort on the possibility that he might be uncomfortable. Doesn't sound really smart to me. Yeah. No, I guess I just kind of, when I'm, I guess I felt, I mean, it didn't, I was just hopeful, I guess, that, you know, that we would, that the midwife we were working with wouldn't um, act like this because I have a different one now and you know and I've had a different one each pregnancy so I'm always hopeful that it'll when be she like, said I want to do blood work is the time you need to say no yes yeah, yeah. right then yeah. you say no because you don't even really know what she would have done do you you're acting um, like she wouldn't have been your midwife but she might have said oh okay Hmm. Yeah, I guess. I mean, did you then, ask her? No, I didn't. You know, she. So this I is mean, all smoke and mirrors, supposition and assumptions, isn't it? Not a bit of it's real, except you're abandoning your needs and your health, and that's real. Hmm. And you have done that. Based on what? Um, I guess, yeah, like um, fear of worst case scenario or something, or just based on the worst yeah. case 
scenario, you know, I don't think that that's the best way to live life. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. But let me just check a few things. Do you Mm -hmm. live at a great distance from a hospital? No, not at all. So should you, for instance go into labor without a midwife there and there was a complication, you could actually get to a hospital? Yes, yeah, easily. Easily. Mm -hmm. So there is no worst-case scenario, is there? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I guess it's more just, I guess, yeah, like I've never really envisioned that I could actually even get that far without you know, I don't know, just all sorts of drama ensuing or something. So. And your and the drama would come from? Yeah, I mean, my husband, just because he would feel. He's usually pretty like, dramatic? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess he is. <laughs> uh-huh. And demanding? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Definitely, like, I mean, I usually just kind of feel like it's really emotionally immature, but I guess demanding would, I yeah, I don't know if that's the adjective I would usually use, but and so difficult. And so what do you do with people who are emotionally immature? What's the best thing to do, give in to them? No. Mm-mm. Nope. Nope. Yeah, not at all, actually. No, not at all. I, you, it's yeah. it's going to make that behavior worse, isn't it? Yeah. This is just a pregnancy. we got the whole, like, infancy and toddlerhood ahead. Arg. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and over time we've gotten, I mean, it's definitely to where he's, you know, gotten to know me better and, and I've gotten to know him better to where we work together I feel like um better so it's not like just straight up like him. Was this an arranged marriage? No. <laughs> no. Well, Four you... kids later you're finally getting to know each other? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean it does sort of you know, you do get to know people differently once you have kids and stuff. It changes things, I guess is kind of what I meant. Like we knew each other but then we had kids and now we And now you're different. Know each other. Now you yeah. are different people. I read this great joke in Reader's Digest. This little girl asked her mom, who was a therapist, Mommy, what's normal? And Mommy says, that's a person until you get to know them. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we change. We all change. Our lives bring mm-hmm. us different things, and we re- react to those things, and we make choices. And I'm all for you making your choices based on what's best for you and not what's best for anyone else. Yeah. Not your midwife, not your husband, not anyone but you. Because even if you start off 100% for you and 100% for what you want, we both know that's going to get diluted, isn't it? Um, yeah, I guess there's... Yeah, and so if you start off with only 50% of what you want, that's going to get diluted too. So start with 100% of what you want. Put it out. Mm-hmm. Of course there's room for compromise. But yeah. if you start out compromised, by the time you give room to compromise, you are so far away from what you want that it's very hard to be happy. Yeah. I'm not just talking about I mean, you. I'm, I'm talking about millions yeah. and millions of women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, when you have, I mean, it's definitely, you have, you know, especially when you're uh, coupled with someone and then you have children. I mean, yeah, you do, I think 
there's obviously a tendency to start to kind of put yourself um, last, you know. How old are your other children? Um, I have a 16-year-old and uh, two other little ones, one that just turned five and one that just turned three. They're both summer babies. Mm-hmm. And they're all, yeah, real healthy, happy so what Hello. I'm thinking is that you're a woman who's experienced in pregnancy. Mm-hmm. That you're a woman who has some experience of being in her changing body. And that what I would like to offer you is some way for you to put more trust in yourself than in the experts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's not I mean, a time to say, gee, I'm putting on a little weight when we're pregnant. Yeah, you're supposed yeah. to be doing that. And it's a little hard to get the weight off from those previous children. That's kind of normal, too, and not necessarily something wrong. Mm. And so perhaps where the confidence comes is in backing off from perhaps a war that you're waging against yourself. Perhaps every change seems to you to have the flavor of something wrong. Yeah, well, I definitely, I'm, so, yeah, there was a big lifestyle change around that time, too, where I stopped working all the time. I mean, I wasn't pregnant when I noticed that um, I seemed to kind of gain uh, extra weight and then just have a hard time. Like, my metabolism just kind of shifted, but I was also, I I think it was like 33, so I feel like, that, um, you know, probably played a part in it because I think your metabolism obviously changes from in your 20s, you know, when you're in your 20s and you get into your 30s. You can um, that if you that want to. It's pretty limiting belief. Oh, okay. And you're at 76 <laughs> and I don't notice that my metabolism has changed much. Oh, okay. Well, I mean. I noticed and so, a level of activity could change, but that that's up to me. Yeah. And, yeah, and I did um, that my w- how I nourish myself is my choice. Mm-hmm. We've been talking today about nourishing herbal infusions and how uh, wonderful it is to have something to drink that has virtually no calories, about five calories a cup, um, that is so loaded with nutrition. Mhm. How are you doing on drinking your nourishing herbal infusions? Oh, really well. Yeah. Great. I'm cycling through the five, and I and I do, and then I was going to add some red raspberry leaf just for uterine health, I guess. Like while I'm pregnant, I thought that would probably be a good it's a idea. Really nice tea. Mm-hmm. I like it better as a tea than an infusion. Oh, okay. Mhm. Mm -hmm. Kind of astringent. So, again, um, what I would like to leave you with is you're fine. You're going to be fine. And if you're not fine, you're going to know. And you can seek help then. If you don't want to be managed, which it sounds like this midwife is doing, then just end the relationship with the midwife. Yeah. Well, I, I did talk to my husband about that too. Like we were, I was telling him my feelings and reading some of the emails, you know, the correspondence back and forth and how, and he said, yeah, that sounds very directive. Like she just said, you need to be on levothyroxine or whatever it's called. And, um, and that was kind of, yeah, it was just an order. <laughs> basically. Yeah. And I thought, so, yeah, so he's willing to support that. And, you know, I'm happy to talk to him if he wants to talk to me, but I don't think that you're managing your pregnancy yourself as risky behavior. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of afraid to take that because uh, I, I mean, I guess, and I mean, that was kind of what the question was, I guess, in a way. I understand like, that you're afraid, but we just established that there isn't a worst case scenario, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You are close to a hospital. You need a hospital, you can get to a hospital. We're not talking about somebody who's two hours' drive from the nearest hospital. We're not talking about somebody who's never had a baby before. We're not talking about somebody who had her last baby 15 years ago. Right? This is still pretty present in your memory. Mm Mm-hmm what it is to be pregnant and to have have a healthy pregnancy. Your body isn't going to try to trick you. Your body wants wants to tell you the truth. And so really, um, your task is to be aware and to be aware without anxiety, right? Yeah, that's kind of tricky, but I think, I mean, I feel like, yeah... Yeah. I think I am, yeah. I think you are. I I wouldn't say this to everybody. Again, I'm checking things out with you and saying, you know, I think that you're ready for this. I think you're ready to move into this area of power. I wouldn't necessarily go so far as my friend Janine Parvati, who said, the two of you got it in there. You can get it out. You don't need any help. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, the last baby actually she came before uh, the midwife. Right. So she was a midwife, and that's what she she's. Most people want to hire. Her. She said, "You don't need a midwife. You two got it in there. You can get it out on your own." Oh, she thought, I wish I could find that midwife. That's not the midwife that I find at all. <laughs> well, just yeah. maybe, maybe you want to call to the spirit of Janine Parvati to be there with you as your guardian. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, yeah, the last baby, uh, she came before the midwife got here, so. There you go. Super easy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just happened and, you, you know. know my maybe next- this mantra will help. Repeat after me. I am enough. I am enough. I do enough. I do enough. I give enough. I give enough. <laughs> And I am safe. Are you not safe? Yeah, no, I I am. I'm just, I don't know. Sorry. No, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. Just take a look at what's going on. It's okay. If you don't feel safe, that's important, isn't it? Well, I probably I guess I don't feel a lot of those things. <laughs> That's what yeah. affirmations are about. Yeah. Right. We say that we say those things even if we don't necessarily think they're true. And by saying them, the tail wags the dog and they become true. I am enough, I right. do enough, I give enough and I am safe. And whenever other thoughts come into your mind, you come back to your mantra. I am enough, I do enough, I give enough, and I am safe. Okay, uh, I will definitely yeah. keep that. All right. Yes. First, all right? <laughs> oh, would you want? <laughs> you first. Would you want me to? Oh, you I want, want you to put right yourself now? first, all right? Oh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. And you, if you, have to, okay, if you need somebody to blame, you blame me. You say, Susan told me to do it. Okay. Okay? No, I didn't want to do it, but Susan forced me to. Okay. All right? I'm totally happy to take the blame. Okay. All right? (laughs) Okay. Three blessings. Thanks for your call. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Good night. All right. Uh, We have about 10 minutes before our guest is scheduled to join us. There are four hands raised. Let's jump back to the 646. From the 646, are you live with Susan? 
Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Um, so I'm actually in the supermarket right now, so I hope there's no background noise. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I, first of all, I wanted just to um, let you know, I don't know if you remember I called a few weeks ago about the drop ditch that I had, um, and you recommended some golden seal. Do you remember? Yes, I do. Okay, well, I, it's... it's been a great success, so thank you for that. I um, I made I ground it into some powder and then the roots, and then I um, made it into a paste, and then applied the paste to the skin, and then put some underwear on, and then some shorts on, and I went to bed, and I did the same thing every night for four or five nights, I think, and yeah, completely clear. So thank you so much for that. Wonderful. And just so people who don't remember uh, know, oh, yeah. what did you put it on? So I applied it to the uh, upper areas of my legs um, and in between my buttocks and around my buttocks. Um, and I had Joxitch, which is the fungal, um, uh, this fungal thing. Uh, so, yes. And that cleared it up. So, a fungus infection. Infection, sorry, that's the word I was looking for, sorry. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, it makes a bit of a mess, of course, but it was very effective. So, yeah, thank you, Susan, I really appreciate that. Um, thank you for calling in and letting us all know. It really helps. Yeah, no problem. I've got a quick question on herbal infusions. So I've been sure. drinking the, um, the herbal infusions for quite some time now, maybe just over a year. Um and I thank you again for that. Um, and the other lady just mentioned it about uh, one of my questions was the red raspberry leaf. I noticed on your um, YouTube channel, you talked a few years ago, you did the red raspberry leaf infusion, and I started doing it myself. Um, I wanted to ask about that, and I also wanted to ask if you recommend any other herbal infusions other than the, the main five that you talk about regularly. I'm a little unclear about what you said. I don't drink red raspberry leaf infusion. I don't okay, like no, red was... raspberry leaf infusion. Okay. I just suggested that she not drink red raspberry leaf infusion, that she drink it as a tea instead. Okay. Um, and if you go to YouTube, there's a whole series of uh, videos on infusions, and there's a whole bunch of other infusions that you could... Use basically, you can make an infusion from any plant that doesn't have a strong smell. Ah, okay. Wow. So astragalus, yes. Okay. Sage, so. no. Elderberry, yes. Golden seal, no. Oh, okay. Like nourishing herbal infusions, so the. The ideal plants are nutritive plants, which means they have bland flavors. Ah, uh, okay. okay. All right, marshmallow, yeah. right, berries, elderberries, right, goji berries, uh, amla berries. All of those make oh, yeah. wonderful infusions. Hibiscus is, you know, our like ace in the hole. But in the summertime, there's always half a gallon of hibiscus infusion in the fridge that you can pour some into your water bottle with some water and ice because it's great diluted. Yes, it's a lovely flavor, the hibiscus. Um, oh, isn't it just glorious? Oh, so, so good. Um, so refreshing. It reminds me then of like a cranberry kind of, um, like the texture of it, I suppose, is maybe the right word, I'm not sure, but the... But it was just so flavorful. Um, I did get a bit of a stomach ache, and I'm not sure. I was drinking marshmallow roots. Separately. Marshmallow um, roots is lovely. When you say a stomach ache, is that above your belly button? No, it was below, I think. Yes, it's not really your stomach, then, is it? Okay, okay. Because your stomach is above your belly button, right? I see, yeah. Yeah, so I think you're talking about a belly ache. A belly ache, okay. Um, right, which means it's your gut, your intestines, not your stomach. Yeah. And marshmallow would be great. 
Yeah, I'm not sure if it was one of the infusions or if it's just something else at the time. Yeah, M- marshmallow is, is lovely, slippery elm. Uh, linden, of course, comfrey. Yeah. Yeah. Can you make an infusion from slippery elm? You could, but you wouldn't be able to drink it. It would be so thick. I usually right. use slippery okay. elm powdered mixed with honey as slippery elm balls rather than make infusion. My daughter takes slippery elm bark and puts it in water and boils on, on the stove and pours out. It's called gruel. It's like kind of like a, an oatmeal, right? And then yeah. puts more water and keeps boiling it and just, you know, does it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, because years ago I was... Um one thing with the infusions, I've just started drinking mullein leaf, and it's got a very musty taste to it. But um, I, I, I've heard what you said about respiratory health with mullein, and I um, years ago I was a smoker for many years, and I it just didn't agree with me. I know I know smoking isn't, isn't a good thing, you know, for most people, but I just really had a hard time as a smoker. I, I was always getting, you know, respiratory issues and chest infections and things. And, um, you had a hard time with the what? Smoking cigarettes. Oh, you had, a, and you said it's good for people. No, no, I was saying that I I was a smoker many years ago, and I've always had I, I always had a hard time as a smoker with my lungs. I was very I your was lungs complained about your smoking. I yeah, so so constantly. So mullein leaf infusion is the great restorer of the lungs. Yes. And I, I've just started drinking it, like, maybe uh, last week I started. And, um, again, I wanted to thank you because I'm already noticing the difference. And um, But I've had many respiratory issues ever since I was a smoker, which was 10 years ago. But I'm still getting a lot of issues now. I've never had a diagnosis of asthma or anything, but I'm sure there's some, some underlying issue. But, um, yeah, so I'm very excited to see how I get on with the mother. Thanks for your call. Green blessings. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. All right. And we have time for another call. That's good with you. Um, Let's see. From the next caller dialed in from the 714 area code. From the 714, you are live with Susan. Hello, Susan. Hi. Um, I know there's not much time left, so I want to um, quickly see if you can suggest some herbs um, for uh, ulcers, like dead sores. Honey. Like the skin is honey. Missing. Honey, 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 honey. Honey heals bed sores, ulcers so fast. And it could be any honey at all. The darker um, the honey, the more healing it's supposed to do. But um, I had a friend, um, I have a friend with multiple sclerosis who's bedridden, and she was in a facility, and she got a bed sore, and they were doing all this stuff, and I, it was still there like two weeks later. And finally I said to them, I said, you got to put honey on this. And I actually went to the drugstore and bought honey bandages for her and put, put a honey bandage on it. And then when I came back the next week, they had actually had the doctor's order for honey, and it was healing. Wow. So you can just go right okay. to the drugstore and get honey bandages. Oh, great. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank Green you. blessings. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Would you like another caller, or would you like to go to the guest? Let's go to our guest if she's here. She is here. Kim Kitchen is a multidisciplinary artist working in audio and film as a result of a debilitating and transformative illness. She explores collective cultural understandings of the female body, its intersections with and presence within the natural world. This is evident through the inclusion of ritual in her work, particularly in To Reconvene to Shoreline, which draws on her lifelong connection to the primordial mother and to knowledge of her ancestral homelands of old Europe. 
This ongoing research and consciousness has deeply influenced her artistic practice, which has been largely tactile, focused on painting, sculpture, installation, and performance. Currently, Kim engages her practice of critical inquiry of body-mind relations and the self-reflexive relationship between ability and artistic production through largely multimedia approaches. The significant changes in mobility, old spaces, become unknown insofar as the body must learn anew how to navigate through them. The familiar becomes unfamiliar. The body is tasked with relearning how to exist, reaching out in charge renewed and ever-urgent ways through creativity. Kim's community activism is inclusive, celebratory, and exuberant. In contrast, her work is introspective, thoughtful, and prompts quiet reflection. Now, more than ever, interdependence is fundamental for this disabled artist. Welcome to the show, Kim. Thank you, Susan. Well, we all want to know about the debilitating um, and transformative illness. Let's start there. Well, uh, seven years ago, rheumatoid showed up, and uh, I was bedridden for three years. And, uh, you know, was looking at all kinds of Treatments I can hardly hear you, Kim. Okay, I will speak up. Is this better? Oh, thank you so much. What was it that showed up three years ago? Seven years ago, rheumatoid. Rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid disease, yes. Got and it. it. And it, uh, you know, it laid me out. I was in bed for three years. I had no mobility. So it was really this incredible time, um of, you know, looking at different ways to continue my art practice and my life, right? I was very healthy. I lived in the bush. We were, you know, growing our own foods, and we were homesteaders. We always had been. So, you know, illness came to me, and Susan, I remember, you know, I've been walking with you for so many years. Up here in northern Ontario, Canada, uh, you know, reading your wise woman ways and listening to all those rituals of becoming crones and crowning the crone. And so I read this piece that you had written about illness and disease uh, because, you know, we really live in such a shame-based society around illness. And, of course, I can't remember the exact quote, um, Susan, but, you know, you talked about disease as being part of health. And this just really inspired me, you know, in many ways. That's really something that we all hope that doesn't happen to us. I know that most people listening are going, oh, my goodness, yeah. what, a, what a, a a scary thing that suddenly, as it were, overnight, that Kim goes from being a, a healthy, happy homesteader to a bedridden person with a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease. Yeah. Yeah, it really is surreal when it's happening. And it takes a long time, you know. I mean, you go through all of the emotions of grief and loss and, you know, relationship. And, I mean, it, there's just so much that happens. But, you know, I I really have stayed clear on my path of living out my potential, and so a really good friend of mine brought me a audio recorder when I was in bed because before that I was painting and I was a sculptor. I was doing performance work um, in regards to my 25 years of counseling 
uh, sexual violence and domestic violence. Um, and and so all of these tools, right? I mean, I think that's what I heard you saying in the last couple calls you had, you know, this trust, this trust we have to we have to have in ourselves to know what we need and how we move forward in 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 any real situation. I do um meditation practice called um just went out totally out of my mind. Created by Judith Blackstone, who is a dancer who is in a car accident which almost paralyzed her. Mm-hmm. And laying on the floor uh, basically, you know, pretty much unable to move. Yes. Um, she, like you said, I'm I'm not taking this laying down, even though I'm laying down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my friend brought me this this wonderful audio recorder, and she said to me, you know, just start talking into the recorder every day if you can. And and you know, we were living deep in the bush. We were on this incredible habitat of swamp with bear and wolf and 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 she said, you know, record the the sounds of your environment, which I did and and that piece I ended up spending 3 years after making it a spoken word soundscape called Able to Disabled uh my changing landscape, right? Which is just like all those steps we go through when we experience those kinds of trauma, right? Where our life changes significantly. Um, so yeah, that is up on my website for everyone to hear. It's a 25 minute piece, audio piece, but turned into film because my work now is so directed by wanting to make it accessible. You know, mm. I want people. Yeah, I, I just really want to make the work accessible. Accessible. It's called realization process. Just like yeah. realization process. Okay. When you say accessible, you mean online? Yeah, not only online, but the the disability, like the able to dis- disabled um, piece I'm I'm talking about. I actually had it um, at ASL sign language, and there's closed captioning. You, you know, one of the things, right, that we know since COVID uh, and and being able to go online is that. You know, for all of us folks that that cannot make it to spaces, you know, this invited us to the table. And not that it was really done for us. That wasn't the intention. But the greater population needed access, right? So mm-hmm. one of the things we're really advocating now in the disability community is that this this can't end. Like, we have to continue advocating for inclusion. Right, so making things really accessible. How have you transferred the tactile process from the multimedia work that you used to do into the new kinds of multimedia that you do? Well, you know, audio... Audio is this really beautiful, uh, it, it allows me to be in my bed, when, you know, it, it allows me to turn down the volume. And because, of course, with my autoimmune disease, you know, the energy, I have to strategically go through the day and manage energy, right? So lots of noise and stimulants and, you know, all of those things going on can just really drain me quickly. So audio has become like a really lovely friend. You know, I can put my headphones on and sit quietly and have no lights. And then after I regained, um, you know, feeling, feeling even stronger, I stepped into working with, in film. So this latest body of work, which I've been working on uh, for three years, and and the other the other really important piece is I no longer make work alone. 
I work. I make work in a team. You know, I I apply for grants with the Canada Council and the Ontario Arts Council, and they've been so very supportive in deaf and disability. Um, and 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 so now, you know, I hire a personal support person who looks after my needs when I'm on a shoot, and 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 I hire a videographer and a photographer. So the idea of making work alone you know, how I painted and sculpted and all of that before has changed completely. And this feels like everything we know that exists in the natural world, whether it's fungi or lichen, you know, herbs and plants that do better growing together. You know, it just feels like this this magnifying uh, experience of interdependence with my team and making work. Well, one of the questions that you suggested that I asked you was what inspires you, but it sounds to me like everything inspires you. Pretty much. Pretty much it does. I mean, you know, and and not that this whole process hasn't had, you know, really difficult times, but but I but I am inspired for sure every day. And, you know, my my goddess, my goddess history background was, oh my gosh, so many years ago, like 35 years ago, meeting uh, Joan Marler and Jennifer Berzan and connecting into the work of Maria Gimbutas and, you know, spending much of my life just really researching back into time and geography and history. And and that has, you know, led me to be a ritualist and a ceremonialist. Um, and just reclaiming, right? Reclaiming those incredible pieces of our lineage. I think you said that there was a video of your art or a video which was your art at your website. Could you say a little yes. more about that and let people know how they can find that website? So it is KimKitchenInTheStudio.com, and there you will find. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't sell. Like I don't intend to sell my work online. I mean, it's happened over the years, but um, this website for me is is archival. It's it's about really having space in the world to, you know value and talk and have a portfolio of work that can be seen. Um, you know, my desire in the future is to really, really archive women's work throughout northern Ontario because it's so lacking. I, I'm sure it is everywhere, but um, that definitely is a, is, a, is a goal, a future goal, you know. So on my website, you'll see my home page, and, and there's a trailer there of an upcoming show uh, called to, to Reconvene the Shoreline, and that happens September 16th here in North Bay at the WKP Kennedy Gallery. And, and after that show, I will be submitting to galleries throughout the world. And this this work about primordial the primordial mother and you know, the sacredness of the earth and of our bodies and the coming together of that. And how, as, you know, as women, it is the time for us, like never before, to become even more radical. As you know, Susan, radical Susan. We were talking today about it being Lamas, the, yes. feast, the feast of the first harvest. Or the loaf mass. Yes. And that this is the holiday in which we honor the grain and the grain goddesses, the sacred corn mother, Ceres, Demeter. And I was talking about how the great gifts of women, milk and grain, have been demonized. Yes. In modern era. You know, that's like obviously, right? That's the work you've done your whole life is changing all that about as well as myself. 
it's powerful work, Susan. Yeah. Because I, I see especially with, can... like, rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to hear from, you know, all kinds of people, oh, no bread, no dairy. No, oh, this is, you know, triggered by or it's ex- activated by or, you know. And the evidence is just can't to non-existent for those kinds of ideas, but they are very prevalent. You know, here's the thing. I mean, it's this other piece that goes along with dis-ease, right? And, and I mean, I, we're molecules, right? We're molecules. And shit happens all the time. If we look at anything in the natural environment, there's leaves on a tree that are not full in leaf. You know, they are decomposting as we speak, right? Like, I just go back to what that powerful message I received from you years ago that talked about how dis-ease is part of health. We can't, like, it's not like we can escape these things, you know? I, I just think it's yes, like... Thank, thank you for reiterating that and bringing it's that... It's so important. It's just so okay. important. Yeah. We're not greater than the leaf. We're not greater than the fungi piece. We're not greater than the lichen. We're part of it. Yeah. 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 So, from the shores of Lake Nipissing here in North Bay, honestly, it's really, really such a pleasure to talk to you and thank you for your incredible bodies of work over the years. Uh, Really, deep gratitude. Where do you, you say you're going to be offering your work to galleys all over the world. Yes. And I'd like to hear a little more about your um, vision of where you're going and what you're doing. So, This exhibition is made up of different components. One is a 10-foot by 12-foot film projected onto the gallery wall. It's a 16-minute film uh, that that we shot, my team of four. We went out on the south shore of Lake Nipissing, big, beautiful body of water, tens and tens of thousands of years old, on these bodies of rocks, you know, the pink and the granite. And... And we held ritual, and we, you know, we just kind of, my, my ideas were to, that people could really see their bodies in nature, that they're no different, that they're, you know, we're exactly that, and that is exactly us. Um, and along with it is six-channel audio, and this was something new I wanted to learn, but it's, there's six speakers in the gallery, and and out of those speakers are going to come chanting and spoken word um, that you'll hear in different ways throughout the audio system. And then hanging from the ceiling are these huge banners, uh, images printed on eco-polyester that hang and just move ever so beautifully in the gallery space. And a mixed media piece I made, which is called which is called memory cord, because when we're born, you know, everyone who holds us and smiles at us and who we see crying, who we see dying, they all imprint on us. So I I feel like I made this memory cord out of a baby book of names, right, because of all the names that touch us in our lives. Yeah. Oh, what good descriptive powers you have. You took us all right there. Thank you, Susan. Yes. (laughs) Well, you know, there's this great thing about the arts, right, that really allows us to go deeper and deeper in expressing certain things that are just so difficult to articulate, right? As a friend of mine once said, if I could say it in words, I wouldn't be a musician. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) There are things that aren't worthy. We need need to 
be willing to do it sometimes without the words. Words are good. I'm all for the words. Yeah. But sometimes the words don't don't get as far enough out as we need to get out. Yes. Mm. The um the other work that I've just finished is about death ritual. And it's called Her Voice, The Waves Like Silk. And years and years ago, uh, when we were living in a community uh, where we had lots of Iranian friends, I learned about this ritual of when you die, your body is washed in with rose water by your family, and then it is wrapped in silk. <laughs> And so years and years ago, I was somewhere and I saw a piece of silk, a very (laughs) large piece of silk that I fell in love with, and I bought it for my death ritual (laughs) so that my children would have this silk. And so I created this body of work. It's There's a a four-minute film. I love those short films. I love making little short films that are just so like boom, 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 you know, so powerful. And you will see, uh, I just released a book. I self-published a book called Her Voice, The Waves Like Silk. And you will see it on my website, too. Um, And it is for sale. And it's just about the whole process of making that piece of work. And again, about looking at how I make my art more accessible. And getting a real feeling for the scope of what you're hoping to do and what you mm. are coming from and how you've not just, I mean, people would say, oh, she overcame her disability to make this art. But you've done really, you've done something far different from that. You've You've used what happened to you to move you into a new place as an artist? Yeah. You know, opportunity, opportunity, right? Yes, and you, t- but you, t- there's always opportunity, but not everybody's willing to take it. Agreed. It's scary. It's what you're doing isn't normal. You're supposed to just lay back and complain, right? Oh, boy. Not this one. <laughs> and of course not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're right. I mean, we're always making choices, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Always making choices and always making stories. Yes. The telling of our stories so important. One of the key nutrients, one of the nourishments that is so um, changed in modern life, because it used to be that the culture had stories. And so I think when you talk about your culture of old Europe, of the stories, those stories from there. Yes. Yes, I you know, I come from you know, my 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 grandfather is Belgian, my grandmother uh uh from Sicily, and I was just looking back in some old letters and and stories being told about my great grandparents. And in there it says, we never really believed that my great great grandmother was from Italy because of her cooking. She cooked like she was from the island of Mykonos in Greece. Mm. You know? Again, <laughs> the right? Food will tell. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's, so, that's yeah, here's, those here's, are two pretty different cultures to bridge there. No, I, you know, I, I think about that, too, you know, just 
I, I had an aunt who recently died, and so I was given, you know, some of these photo albums and all of these papers, and, and I've been reading through it and just thinking about, you know, how how much those people were traveling back then. I mean, you know, immigrating to Canada, all over the world, um, and in such difficult times. You know, and then I wonder, you know, I wonder, do we ever ask, like my, I'd love to ask my great-grandfather, like, what were you thinking leaving the island of Mykonos, you know? Because now in northern Ontario, I'd be like, geez, would I ever love to live on the island of Mykonos? (laughs) Different climate. Right? (laughs) Most of the time, people leave... Because where they are is unlivable. Yes, no, exactly. And then it they changes. are being persecuted. Their lives are being threatened. There are no jobs. There is there no, no job. soil. There, those yeah. are the usual reasons that people pick up from what we might think of in retrospect as an idyllic existence, but obviously was not to them. No. No, and at I mean, a time... my grandparents fled Russia because they were Jews and they were being killed. Yes, yes. I'm sure they would have been very happy to continue to live there. Listen, but that our was not possible for them anymore. Our, our shared stories again, right? Yeah. That bring us to and where we are many now. Of us living in America, it is that yeah. shared story of our parents were pushed out of where they would have happily stayed for yeah. one reason or another, even for the people on the West Coast, because they were the ones who were pushed out of the East and had to move west or more and more west. Yes. Yes. So a lot of that, you know, it, you are fascinating to talk to. Well, and as, you. as I said, your powers of description are wonderful. You really take us right into your world. But we're coming to the end of our time together, unfortunately, because it is a blog talk show, and they really, like, shut the door on us. I know. So I want to give you this opportunity, if there's anything else that I haven't asked you that you really wanted to talk about. Well, uh, just thank you for this incredible gift of uh, being on your show and having this time with you and all who's tuned in. Really marvelous, and um, I just wish you all all the blessings. And we have each suffered about a hundred mosquito bites here. No, we might talk with you. <laughs> so we've been fascinated that we're willing to sit here and be literally eaten. I right. just counted twelve mosquito bites just on my left butt cheek. <laughs> Which hey, well, is why I'm, I'm really hoping about that hundred. someday I mean, You just multiply that by the rest of my body I would say that's oh about, about the number <laughs> I'm just really do an art piece. someday Mosquito my bites ex- at the pond <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, Thank you so much, Kim For sharing with us And for reminding us That art belongs to Everyone. Yes. Not just people who can stand up and paint or people who are physically strong enough to manipulate things, but that art is part of all of us. And uh, it doesn't even necessarily have to be good art because art has a way of changing us, whether we like it or not. Sure does. Thank you. I believe that the work that we're all doing, and especially the work that you're doing, is the reweaving of the healing cloak of the ancients. And I see that what you are doing is that you are bringing to this weaving threads that other weavers have overlooked, have not noticed threads that are fine, threads that are small, threads that don't necessarily speak up for themselves, Mm. that you're gathering these threads and bringing them into the safety 
of this great healing cloak. I really appreciate what you're doing. Thanks, Susan. And Sarah Ellen, thank you for helping me. And listeners, thank you for helping me restore herbal medicine to its rightful place as people's medicine. Green blessings are all around you. And hey, check out the amaranths, okay? Okay. Okay. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye.